Let's look at some of the objections to utilitarianism, perhaps more broadly to consequentialism. And I'll start with one that um, if you've read Rachel's, you'll be familiar with. Um, so he asks, uh, actually it's not Rachel's original example, but you're asked to imagine a situation, this is quite an old example uh, when it was first came, uh, so you think back that you're in one of the southern states of the US uh, in the days when uh, African Americans were uh, an oppressed group, uh, dominated by uh, whites, and um, there was, there could be anyway on certain occasions, uh, mob rule uh, and uh, the mob would lynch people of, of African descent um, without the law really interfering. Uh, so this might happen, for example, if a, uh, let's say, a white woman had been raped and said she was raped by an African American, so the mob might uh, round up a few African Americans and proceed to lynch them. And tragically, that kind of thing did happen. So you imagine in this example that you're the sheriff in this town. Um, and the mob is about to string up half a dozen African Americans and lynch them because a white woman says that she was raped by, by an African American, but she can't identify the person who raped her. You are not able you just don't have the, the physical capacity, you don't have any reinforcements, you're not able to compel the mob to let these people go. But there is one way in which you could persuade them to at least let five of them go. You could identify, you could claim that you have evidence that one of them is the person who committed the rape. In fact, you have no such evidence. But that's the only way in which you can bring about a situation in which only one person dies rather than six. So the utilitarian answer would seem to be that's what you ought to do. If you assume that that's the situation, that everything that is relevant to the situation or its consequences is what I've told you now. Um, so clearly, either in terms of a hedonistic utilitarian pleasure and pain and suffering, or preferences, take into account uh, the suffering of the people who are going to be lynched and of their families, uh, the loss of someone they love, it seems clearly better that only one person should be lynched rather than six. Um, and you have no way of knowing, you know, it would be better, of course, you might say, if, if it was only the guilty person, but you have no way of knowing whether any of these six people is the guilty person. Um, so utilitarianism does seem to say that that's what you ought to do. You ought to lie about having this evidence as long as you can do it in a convincing way so that only one person will be lynched rather than six. And for many people, this is a powerful objection to utilitarianism. That is, they say, look, you're a sheriff. You're sworn to uphold the law. Um, you know that it's against the law to give, produce false evidence against someone. And that's exactly what you're doing. You're producing false evidence and you're also conniving in the lynching of an innocent person or the hanging of an innocent person. Maybe the mob will say, okay, so you've got the evidence, we won't lynch him, you go and hang him. But let's say you have to do this and if you don't do it pretty soon, again, they'll, they'll lynch some more people. So you're conniving in not only are you giving false evidence, you're conniving in the murder of an innocent person and you're an officer of the law. How could that be the right thing to do? Well, that's an example of a type of objection that is reasonably common. And so let me just say a little bit about that, that type of objection before considering the particular case. What you're being asked to do in this situation is you're saying, here's an implication of a theory, right? Somebody comes up with a theory, consequentialism. That theory has, an has this implication in these possible circumstances, or at least imaginable circumstances. 
I don't accept that implication, therefore I can't accept the theory. So what should we think of that kind of example? Um, it's true that the, we can imagine situations in which theories produce consequences that seem counterintuitive, clash with our ordinary moral intuitions. Um, these situations may be more or less imaginary, hypothetical. So the situation that I've described, I described in a way that I think makes it possible. Of course, you might, there's various things that you might have thought of already, like um, how do we know that there isn't going to be some real evidence to show that who the real culprit is? Um, so maybe the whole story will become unraveled and uh, people will realize that you lied in saying that you had evidence that this person was guilty. And won't that undermine respect for the law and respect for your office? And won't that be a worse consequence still in the long run than the lynching of six people? Well, that's possible and that is something you would need to consider. But often when we produce these examples, we say, well, just imagine that you can be sure in some way that that won't happen. So we can make the example hypothetical. It doesn't have to be that realistic. But the more hypothetical you make, of it, make it, perhaps the more ready you could be to say, it's true that my intuitions reject this kind of conduct, but it's not surprising that my intuition should reject something that would be almost impossible to really happen. Because my intuitions are things that develop through my everyday experiences and my knowledge of the world and my knowledge of human nature. And I don't think they're really reliable if you start describing very unusual cases to me. So that's one possible way of responding to these objections. Um, and you might therefore say, even though intuitively I don't like this idea that the right thing for the sheriff to do would be to manufacture evidence against an innocent person, I don't really trust that intuition that much. And so I am going to say it would be the right thing to do. Although I'm troubled by it, it would be the right thing to do. So that's one way in which the utilitarian can respond. In other words, we sometimes call this biting the bullet on the objection. So if an objection is fired at you and you say, okay, I can, I can accept that. I can swallow the implication of this. So I can still say I'm a utilitarian, even though I'm sort of uncomfortable with the idea that you ought to do this, but um, it's a possible answer to the question. And that's, um, that's something that you can, you can think about yourself. Is that something that you're going to be prepared to do? And there's, there'll be other examples that, um, that I'll come up with which will, where that, that might be a possibility as well. Or alternatively, you can say, no, that would not be right and I simply cannot accept that. And there are, you might then move to a different kind of theory, which again, I'm going to give you some examples of other theories shortly. So that's one objection to utilitarianism. Secondly, I think I already briefly mentioned this, people think that utilitarianism is too demanding um, because it tells us to produce the best consequences. And if you think about the way you live your life, I'm sure that there are a lot of things you do, maybe most things that you do, where you say, look, I could do something that would have better consequences than what I'm doing now at the moment. Let's say you're, you're just relaxing and enjoying yourself. You're not producing anything particularly good. Well, your enjoyment is good, but you could maybe do better things. You could reduce a lot of people's suffering in some way. You could go and help with some charity that's helping people in great need. So you could do better things with your time. Does utilitarianism tell me that I ought always to be doing what will have the best consequences. And again, um, you can think about that kind of objection, 
you can certainly say, well, look, if I spent all of my time working for good causes, I would, I would surely burn out at some point. Um, I'm not going to last very long doing that. I, um, I need some time to relax and enjoy myself. And that's true to some extent for most people, but how much time do you need? Do you only relax to the extent that you really need it? Probably not. Most of us don't. So that's one way you could respond. But another way would be to say, well, utilitarianism is very demanding. And maybe it's more demanding than I can live up to. But nevertheless, that would be the right thing to do. When I'm not maximizing the good, I'm not doing what is right. I may not be doing something terrible. We may have different standards of judging that. But I admit to myself that I'm not really the most ethical life I could be. And that's another response. So I'm not going to say more about that now because, again, that's, that's a topic we're going to be talking about later in the course. And let me draw another distinction now, two forms of utilitarianism that are worth knowing about. Um, what I've been talking about, really, is the idea that utilitarianism judges every individual act that you do. So I gave you the example of the, the sheriff. Would the act of producing false evidence have the best consequences? So the kind of utilitarianism I've been talking about is what is known as act utilitarianism, judging the act. There's another version that has been developed, partly to meet some of these objections that I've talked about. Some utilitarians have said, utilitarianism should not judge every act. It should judge the rule on which you're acting, and whether acting on that rule will have the best consequences. So what should the sheriff think about? The sheriff should not think about if I now produce false evidence, will that have better consequences than not producing it now? The sheriff that should think about, can I make it a rule that I should produce false evidence when I think that doing so will have better consequences? And some people will say, no. Because if that became a rule, it would be known that sheriffs are liable to produce false evidence when doing so will have better consequences. So people would not trust sheriffs. They would say, hey, you say you've got this evidence, but you're just doing this because you think it'll have better consequences. So we don't trust what you're saying. And the result would be to discredit the office of the sheriff and the general principles that we need to rely on about people telling the truth. So. The rule utilitarians will say, the rule that will have the best consequences is that sheriffs should live up to the duties of their office, which include upholding the law. And therefore, a rule utilitarian has a different answer to the objection that I mentioned before. They can simply say, no, the sheriff should not produce the false evidence because the sheriff should act on the rule that will have the best consequences. And the idea of a rule here usually is construed as something that can be publicly known and acted upon. So it's the idea of morality, the rules of morality having to be public and that having certain consequences. So this is a, a version of utilitarianism that is less objectionable to, or less open to these objections that play on our intuitions. But there are problems in formulating the rule, which are similar to the problems I mentioned in the last lecture that Kantians face when they talk about whether you can make the maxim of your action a universal law. So again, you know, even the example I gave you about always leave work an hour after rush hour, um, you have to in some way formulate that so that it can be a rule that has good consequences. And there are other cases as well. Um, for instance, we do think, most people think, that it's sometimes justifiable to tell lies. Um, can you make that a rule? Uh, when, how do you work out what 
rule there would have the best consequences. 